Now, I have to confess that I don't really understand miracles. Partly because I'm a 21st century educated human and I struggle to suspend disbelief, as it were. My logical, rational mind uh, gets caught whenever miracles come into the frame. But more than that, I have a theological issue with miracles. My theology struggles to include this idea that says God responds and intervenes in some ways at some times for some people and not in other ways at other times for other people. That someone's loved one is miraculously saved while another person's loved one is allowed to die. I don't believe in that God. And so I struggle to hold that idea. I struggle to make room for it. And yet, all of the world's great religions have got miracle stories. If you turn to any one of them, you will hear either in their primary texts or their secondary texts these stories about wondrous things. And usually miracles are used to give credence to that particular idea or that particular religion, that particular deity, that particular God. It's used to prove the power of or prove that this thing is bona fide. But I struggle. I don't know what to make of them. I've heard first-hand accounts of physical miracles. I've seen the aftermath, but I struggle. They still get caught for me. Here in Genesis 18 and 21 is the most audacious miracle. We hear this remarkable story about Abraham and Sarah well into their 90s. And at this point, it's been about 13 years since the birth of Ishmael to Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. And yet, Abraham and Sarah themselves, who have been promised this incredible family, this lineage that would number more than the stars, are yet to have a child. And the promise comes, you will bear a child in your 90s. And they do. And Isaac is born. Now, it's a miracle that Abraham could perform. <laughs> but it's also a miracle that here is an impossibility that is made possible, right? It's an audacious miracle. It's not quite raising the dead, but it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Now, I wonder if, like me, that miracle seems a little too strange, a little too distant, a little too beyond our uh, experience to really get a hold of. And so I've got some image uh, which I'm going to show you on the screen. This is just a very short video, which is a little closer to home for us. It comes with a trigger warning that it does... Um, have scenes of the aftermath of the, the effects of war and uh, some of the desperation of that. And so, uh, with discretion, thank you. في أحد الأيام تعرضت منطقة الأنصاري لقصف بالبراميل المتفجرة. حسنا نطالع العيلة الأولى والعيلة الثانية. العائلة الثالثة هي الأم والولد هي فعلا يعني الأم كانت كتير من فعلة عندها كتير كانت عصبية وكانت عم تصيح يعني هي خايفة على حالة أو خايفة على أبناء بعد الحفل الطويل حسنا نسمع صوت الولد صوت صار يبكي الولد حسنا نسمع صوته وكان كتير محل صعب بعد ما وصلنا لولد هون صار الشغل كتير بده حذر يعني هذا ولد عمره أسبوعين أو أكتر بأي لحظة بيطب شيفه أو بيموت أو بختلق الأطناع الساعة طبعا هي ما يكلمة الأرض يعني عمل كتير حزر يعني هي روح بدك تتعامل معها بشكل خطير جدا يعني إنه طفل عمره أسبوعين يطب فوقه برميل أو ثلاث سقف ما يستيبه شيء يعني وكل هالضغوطات إنه هذا الطفل يطلع أول من برميل وأول من سقف أول من كل شيء Yeah.
معنا وقت قال له قصف 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 ان comes from a 2016 Netflix documentary called The White Helmets Uh, which is about the Syrian volunteer organization called the Syrian Defense Force, a uh, civil defense force that rushes to locations of bombing, bombings to rescue survivors. And this particular incident, if you missed the text on the bottom of the screen, was about a two-week-old baby being pulled from the rubble uh, when a three-story building uh, was barrel-bombed. And so tons, literally tons of concrete and steel piled on top of a two-week-old baby. It boggles the mind. And I can't watch that without having a lump in my throat. There is something simply wondrous about that moment when this baby is pulled from the rubble. And those men, quite rightly, it would seem, call this baby the miracle baby. A little easier to grab hold of, right, than a 90-year-old bearing a child. But something in there, right, the miracle baby. Close to home still, it wasn't that long ago when we were seeing reports about Cleo Smith, who had been abducted, having been found alive. I don't know if you can remember the news reports at the time and the, the audio, hearing the police officer calling out and asking her to respond if it was her. And at the time, Australian news media was uh, festooned with this word being thrown around, miracle. It was a miracle. It was a miracle that she was found, a miracle. Closer to home still, perhaps, I can remember a friend of uh, mine and my wife's losing her wedding band, and she turned her house upside down trying to find this wedding band. I don't know if you have been in that moment when you lose something that precious and you look and you look and you look and you just can't find it. There is no possibility that you have not scoured the right uh, corner of your house. And a friend of hers who was a Catholic um, person, a faithful Catholic person, suggested that she pray to St. Anthony, the patron saint of lost things. And so she did in her desperation. And the very next morning, she got out of bed and there in the corner of her room on the carpet was her wedding band. And she proclaimed, it's a miracle. Now, I wonder how we use that word miracle. What is it that connects all of these things? Because on the one level, it seems like we call something a miracle if it's a lucky thing. Something statistically improbable has happened. And we call it a miracle. Well, uh, one mathematician calculated that there are so many things happening in any instant of time that one in a million events should be happening roughly at once per month. Maybe there's something else going on here, though, than just it was really, really lucky that that baby was found alive under all that rubble. Maybe when the word miracle is used, there's something else at play. The theologian and psychologist Richard Beck suggests that when the white helmets called that baby a miracle baby, they weren't talking about the mechanism by which that baby survived, but instead they were making meaning of this baby being found alive. 
They were hallowing that moment. Hallowing, which means making holy or declaring holy. I like this idea that perhaps when we call something a miracle, what we're really saying is that we see the nearness of God in this moment. Like a thin place in the Celtic tradition. A place where the veil between this world and the other is made thin, the sacred and the profane. And we see the nearness of God, we perceive the nearness of God, we hallow that moment. Perhaps that's the way we use that word without even realising we are using it in that way. When Cleo Smith is found after 18 days, that moment is hallowed. We see God there. When our friend found her wedding band, this precious, precious thing that she thought she'd lost forever, she says it's a miracle and she hallows that moment. She declares the nearness of God for her in that moment. I wager that each of us would be able to name any number of things that we've experienced in our life where we would wish to hallow where we would wish to declare the nearness of God. For me, I can think about my call to ministry, the journey that took me to college and to formation and the journey that brings me, in fact, all the way to this pulpit this morning. It's extraordinary. I can't account for it. I can't mark all of the events and all of the incidents and give them rational understanding. I can't do that. Sounds more like an alarm than a ringtone. Thank you, Rads. And I can think of a time when there was a miracle witnessed in the front yard of my parents' house. My uh, childhood home, which is in Bolton Point, on the western side of Lake Macquarie, we've lived there since 1979. And at some point during my childhood, our uh, next door neighbour, immediate next door neighbours, uh, moved out and a new family moved in. And it was a, an older woman uh, and her adult daughter. Now at the time, I was like eight or nine years old and they seemed like they were really, really old but I'm pretty sure they weren't that old. <laughs> they were probably just regular middle-aged people, but it seemed like they were really old. Now, these two women, the mother in particular, there was a story there, which we didn't ever really fully understand. But when we met her, she was a bitter person, angry all of the time. Uh, you could... You could say hello when she was in the yard, and you might get a grunt of recognition. You certainly wouldn't get any kind of reply. Now, as a child, we lived under the tyranny of this woman next door. We, I had three, uh, two older brothers and a younger sister, and we would play uh, we'd quite raucous. We would throw balls that would often end up over the fence, and it became pretty much understood that if the ball went over the fence, it was gone. It was gone. There was no way we were ever going to get it back. She would purposefully keep these things in order to punish us for um, imposing ourselves on her, her sanctuary in that way. It got so bad that whenever our dog barked, like one bark, our next door neighbor would shout out, shut that bloody dog up. Is this tyranny. This went on right into our uh, teenage years and into our adulthood and we saw in my mum a uh, hardening. She eventually closed herself off to these women after years of hostility and outright abuse 
her neighbours telling her how, how horrible she was as a mother, how horrible her children were. My mum slowly but surely guarded her heart from that stuff and closed herself off. In my first year at college, I got a phone call from my father um, to tell me a story. The older lady, the mother, had become gravely ill and had gone into hospital. And he and my mum were in the front garden doing some gardening. And the daughter, who by this stage would have been well and truly in her uh, late 60s, approached my dad and asked if he could speak to my mum, who was literally two metres that way. And dad was like, sure, she's just there. And so this lady walked up to my mum and she said, can you please forgive me for the way that we've treated you all these years? And my mum said, of course. And they embraced. It was like 20 years of pain and heartache had been wiped away. In an instant, it was as if all of that didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was what was possible from now on. And they became close friends. When the mother died a few weeks later, it was my mum and dad who helped arrange the funeral. And it was my mum and dad, my sister, myself and my wife who attended the funeral, the only other people at that funeral, we became a sort of surrogate family for our neighbour. Now that's a miracle I can get my head around. There is newness where before there was no possibility. There's relationship where before there was only enmity. There's the promise of something more where before there was only despair and heartache. So when I read this strange story about Abraham and Sarah, I can see those same fingerprints. I can recognize the same God that I saw and I see in my mum's relationship with this woman, I see this same God in this story of Abraham and Sarah, where there was impossibility and no future, there is now possibility. Where there is only resignation, there is joy and laughter. Where there is no future, there is now the promised future. This same fingerprint, this same God, dare I say, the same kind of miracle. Now it strikes me that this is a posture we assume, a choice we make. We choose to see the world in this way. We position ourselves to understand the world in this way. To hallow these things. But not just the things that are extraordinary. But the ordinary too. Not just the easy and outrageous things that we can't wrap our minds around, but the easy, the everyday. Not just the joys, but the heartaches too. Not just the victories, but the failures too. We would hallow all these things. Not just in churches or waterfalls or sunsets, but in the screaming children, the overtired mother, 
the fading memory, the frail falling, that each of these things would be hallowed because we've assumed that position. We choose to see with those eyes. Because this is the God we meet in Jesus. Jesus who, who sits with the rejected and the outcasts, with those that are forgotten and left behind. Jesus who heals and restores and brings people back. Jesus who seems to transfigure the world wherever he goes where everything seems to be made holy. Everything seems to be hallowed. That even death would be hallowed. Even death would become this thin place through which we recognize the nearness, power, and presence of God. That all of our fears would be set to rest. This is the God we meet in Jesus. The God who transforms, the God who renews, the God who transfigures all the world. And this is our calling. We are to be witness to this. We are to be witnesses to that reality. Not just ones that see, but ones that share in. Ones that offer in our words, in our actions, in our communities, this vision of a hallowed world until the whole world is made new. Amen.